diet has a big role to play in osteoporosis. And if you uh, looked at some meta-analyses where you're combining lots of these studies together from all these cohorts around the world, you find that once you've accounted for lots of other factors, the quality of the diet has a big impact on the risk of fracture. And it's not things like the amount of calcium in the diet. It's not things, you know, the amount of zinc or any, any one item. It's the sort of things we talk about in this podcast all the time, you know, having plenty of vegetables, being protective. It's about having small amounts of processed food. It's it, not having lots of junk food, not having lots of fizzy drinks. So it's that health quality aspect which has come out globally when you look at the meta-analyses as being really important. And it's significant, is it, this difference between a high-quality diet and an average Absolutely, diet? Absolutely, not sort of yes. like 2% that only no, no. scientists can see. No, we're talking sort of 30%, 40% differences uh, okay, so between these differences. extremes. These are, these are really big ones. But it, it's sort of highlighting that the same things that are good for many other diseases are also good for osteoporosis and, and bone. But it's also telling us that it's not you know, as we used to think, all about calcium or all about protein. It's actually the quality of the diet, the combination of foods rather than these individual ingredients which people use to sell supplements. Completely. So I think that's, that, that's right. That, but, and this is true at all ages as far as I know. So, I mean, yeah. you, you've done yeah. some of this work. Ch in ch older children, uh, adolescents, older adults. Uh, the, the, the move towards dietary quality as compared with uh, micronutrients that are specific for bone health has definitely been the direction. I think that's really interesting because I think, you know, one of the things that was most surprising to me in my journey from Zoe over the last seven years is, you know, seven years ago, I assumed that there are these very specific vitamins because they're the things that are on the, you know, the back of the pack and that you see being sold in the stores and that those were what really mattered everywhere. And I think I've subsequently discovered that, you know, there's 100,000 chemicals in food and, and all these other sorts of things, even before they hit your microbiome and they make all these other things. But I had at least until this morning thought, well, at least calcium is really important for bones. You know, I'm sure I learned that when I was 11. And what you're saying, I think, is even there, your total diet may be really important, but it's not because there's calcium in that diet. It's something to do with all exactly. the different Just things. because the calcium is in the bone does not mean that modifying it by increasing its level in, through, in, in, in your stomach will actually have any impact on, on your bones. And Sarah and I had been brought up on this myth that calcium was all important, and we just assumed it was a fact. And it's only really in the last 10 years with all these massive analyses and people starting to look at diet differently, a more global, holistic way of looking at food, that we start to see that actually calcium doesn't even make the list of contenders. So it doesn't matter whether you actually drink milk or not. It's about the quality of your diet. It's really interesting. What you're saying is the calcium does really matter in my bones. Like yeah. I need to have the calcium yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah. But in order to get more calcium in my bones, like uh, not, eating or drinking more calcium it, doesn't help. You were saying like if the road's dug up outside, I can't just give you a bunch of asphalt. That doesn't make it happen. Like I need <laughs> someone to come with that fancy machine that lays it. And so I sort of need to pay the person who's going to lay it rather than just say, oh, I'll, I'll eat some asphalt. This will solve the Eat more the gravel, problem. yeah. That's, That's right. fascinating. <laughs> Now, I think one question a lot of people will be saying is, is there anything specifically, however, that I should be thinking about adjusting? So imagine that maybe I'm going through perimenopause, I'm going through, uh, I've been through menopause. Is there anything that we know about sort of way that I might want to think about changing my diet? Or is this just like overall I need to have care more about the quality of my diet perhaps than when I was I think younger? the number one message is care more about the quality of your diet. Try and get more plants in there because they are – all these sources of other minerals, you know, as you said, there are 100,000 different chemicals in food. So the more diversity we get, the more we are going to get a balance of these things. And so that's why a rich balance of particularly plants is going to give you all these, whether it's zinc or magnesium or phosphate, in, in exactly the right amounts that your body needs because we're evolved to, you know, take it up and absorb it in those ways. That's more important than any saying, okay, I'm going to forget all that. I'm just going to take some vitamin D capsules and drink a pint of milk. So I think in a way that's where we've got it wrong in the past. We've said, well, there's one quick fix here where actually it's going back to, the, you know, there isn't a quick fix. It's this holistic idea. Again, it comes back to food quality. and But I think get the food quality right. And then as Cyrus will tell us, 
there's some really good exercise tips now that at all stages of life that are really important. Right. So could you talk about that? Because actually yeah. you, we haven't mentioned exercise yet. One of the f reasons we have a skeleton and bones is for the muscles to work off and for locomotion, for walking around, running, evading um, hunters uh, in, in, in the olden days. That role of exercise is very close to the starting function of the skeleton itself. We already know that when we start in the earliest stages of life, weight-bearing, we can start to see an acceleration in the uh, mineralization of the skeleton at, the, at those very early uh, well, stages. The toddler's first steps. Yes, it, absolutely. Well, so you're saying once the toddler starts to walk, the, suddenly their bones get stronger. They have been weightless in utero. They come out and they start to, to ambulate and you can see a discernible change in their mineral accrual from the blood, if you like, into the skeletal um, tissue. Thereafter, there's a rapid gain up to age 25. Examples. The serving arm of a tennis player is 15 to 20% higher bone density than the non-serving arm. A stroke or reason for paralysis of a limb leads to massive demineralization of the bones. In so that I just limb. want to make sure, because I think everyone, everyone sort of is familiar with the idea that their muscles shrink if they're not using them. Yeah. But what you're saying is that they're if I use yeah. my arm, for example, your tennis example is like I'm using that arm more and hitting something yeah. with it, my bone is actually going to get bigger Absolutely. and stronger or like Ab denser yeah. and stronger. Absolutely. That's exactly what happens. That's crazy. If you t send someone into space, they'll th their skeleton will dissolve, you know, uh, with calcium leaving the bone and being passed out in the urine. Because they're weightless. Because they're with weightless and therefore no action of the muscles on the bone. Weight-bearing exercise is crucial really at all stages of life. And I think that's the sort of number one lesson people need to learn. And... What we also learned from another experiment is it doesn't have to be huge amounts of time. You don't have to run marathons or That's anything. That's the point. You, of course, you'll do well if you run marathons, but if you just walk an hour three days a week as an older person, you'll still have an improvement in both your bone density and your falls risk, your muscle function and falls risk, such that you'll have an impact on fracture. And what about actually weight bearing exercise. This has come up on a lot of podcasts here, often talking a lot about sort of the muscle benefits, but it seems here you're it's talking about, about impact. It's weight bearing or weight lifting? I'm talking about weight lifting here, where yes. you're actually doing exercise that involves like resistance and something well, This was always heavy. controversial, yeah. weight lifting, yeah. and there was, in the early days, a lot of information suggested that things like swimming and weightlifting didn't give you as much benefit as jumping up and down, yeah. skipping you know, I used to tell my patients to skip for two minutes a day. Yeah. And there are some studies to show that just that is as effective as doing an hour's sort of weight lift. For sure. It's the, it's the operationalization of realistic activity schedules. For someone who's um, uh, interested and uh, uses um, swimming as a hobby, for example, you wouldn't want to discourage them from going swimming, but just point out to them that the evidence would suggest rather more that weight-bearing rather than non-weight-bearing is better for the skeleton. I want to clarify because it's not really clear to me. So, you know, I do go to the gym a few times a week because I'm told it's really good for my health and a lot of that is resistance so I'm, you know, um, doing stuff with weights because I'm also told that's really good for my health. What will the impact of that be on my skeleton? From the research that's been done, it would have a, a measurable effect on your bone density, but we have no idea what it would do to your risk of fracture. Okay, so the bone density will improve, but yeah. it's not. There isn't the studies out there to show what that will do in terms of fracture, fracture risk. And it probably wouldn't improve as much as if you were playing tennis every day. Right. I agree. Um, that's right. And could you help to understand the that's difference? That's because the weight bearing. Cause, could you explain? I think it's because yeah. I don't understand what weight bearing is. I think well, about it it's being jump, weight. It's, Just it's help jumping us. up and down, so you're putting extra pressure on your uh, limbs. Really. Yeah. For so, bo for bone. The sensitive part of the bone cycle is the change, the delta, 
in the force being applied to the bone. So jumping up and down is um, giving lots of stimulus to the bone forming cell. Swimming is giving very little stimulus to the bone forming cell. So it's like, that's why two minutes of skipping may be as good as an hour of walking gently. If you walk briskly, you're gonna be putting more load Therefore, it's Got better. It. So what so would I do? Let's say somebody's listening to this. Yeah. You know, they're motivated to improve their health. They're worried about osteoporosis, maybe because they've been told that there's some risk or there's some yeah. risk in their family. Yeah. What would be the exercise that you would be saying is ideal? So the first thing I'd say to a patient is do not be sedentary. Some exercise is going to be better than being sit sitting, sitting in the armchair and watching the TV. Once you've decided to take exercise, even walking half an hour a day for five days a week is going to do some good to your balance and bone density and risk of fracture. And then if you want a tailor-made exercise regime for osteoporosis, you go and consult a physiotherapist, which we have as part of our team, and they provide you with the specific exercise regimen that uh, is, is appropriate for you. I always told my patients, do something you enjoy, because you're more likely to do that for long periods of time. And if it's weight-bearing, you know, if you can do it brisker, if you can do it with a bit more bounce. If you hate exercise or you, you for example, can't do it for very long, my example of skipping, um, is actually quite a good one. Or some people who are even you know, have arthritic problems can't do that. There was something called a heel raising, which was really big about 20 years ago, where basically you just go up and down on your toes, swinging your arms, and you put your heels down on the ground. So you're not moving far at all. So there's no risk of falling, really. You're just swinging up and down, and as your heels go down on the ground, uh, you just do that for five minutes a day, and that has been shown to have some benefit on it. So in a way, what we're saying is there's some exercise for everybody, whether it's running, whether it's walking slow or brisk, skipping, heel strikes, or any other activity uh, or sport they like doing.